Thank you so much for joining tonight, everyone. Virtually, it looks like we have 185 participants and counting, which is awesome. Uh, my name's Anju. I'm a designer at Cooper Robertson. On behalf of Cooper Robertson and the Cooper Robertson Diversity and Inclusion Committee, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, first, I'd like to thank all the panelists for taking the time out of their night and over the past few weeks to help us to put, putting this together. Thank you all also to Alex from CC Sullivan for promoting this event and to Eamon O'Connor, our moderator, for helping us put together a timely and thoughtful discussion for tonight. This is the third panel in an ongoing series called Cooper Robertson Talks. It's part of the larger Cooper Robertson Diversity and Inclusion Initiative. This talk series really aims to provide a platform for engaging conversations surrounding the primary fields of Cooper Robertson's practice in education, museums, and urban design. As the current pandemic highlights social inequities, including disparities in access to open space, healthcare, and food, public health and social resilience are emerging as key urban design and planning imperatives in cities across the United States. Tonight, our panelists will address the impacts of COVID-19 in the cities and neighborhoods where they work and live. They will also respond to the broader and longer term implications of this pandemic that will affect how we plan and design cities with respect to resource allocation, social safety, and health. So I'm gonna keep this pretty brief so we can hear from the panelists. Um, just to go over a little bit of the format for tonight, each panelist will give a brief response to tonight's panel prompts, which will be followed by discussion with a moderator. Um, please feel free to submit questions for our panelists in the Zoom chat. We'll be leaving time at the end of our discussion for our panelists to respond to the submit questions. Uh, we also want everyone to know that tonight's discussion is being recorded and will be posted publicly online after tonight. So with that, uh, I would like to start by introducing our panelists. We have Signa Nielsen, who's a principal at Matthews Nielsen Landscape Architects. Do you want to say hello and hello. have your face pop up? Signa has been practicing as a landscape architect and urban designer in New York since 1978. Her body of work has renewed the environmental integrity and transformed the quality of spaces for those who live, work, and play in the urban realm. A fellow of the ASLA, she is the recipient of over 100 national and local design awards for public open space projects and is published extensively in national and international journals. Ms. Nielsen is a professor Professor of Urban Design and Landscape Architecture at Pratt Institute in both the graduate and undergraduate schools of architecture and currently serves as president for the Public Design Commission of the City of New York. Ray Figuera, president of the New York City Community Garden Coalition. Ray, I hope you're on. I hope your audio is working. If so, say hello. Yes, hi. Uh, great okay, to be here. Okay, good. Thank you. And to give a short introduction to Ray, he is a strong advocate of community gardens preservation through policy advocacy and action. He believes in the community gardens role in the revitalization of communities and to the overall vibrancy of New York City. He is currently on the city's interagency task force on urban agriculture, is a strategic partner in the planning and development of a community land trust in the South Bronx and is Director of Social Ecological Community Development Projects at Friends of Brook Park. Um, he has won several awards and grants in participatory action research. Aside from his hands-on work, he teaches urban agriculture and green infrastructure at Pratt, Pratt Institute's Graduate Center for Planning and the Environment. So we got two Pratt folks with us tonight, which is great. Ethan Kent, co-director of Placemaking X, works to support public space, leadership, projects, and organizations around the world, building a global placemaking movement. Ethan has traveled to more than 1,000 cities and 60 countries to advance the cause of leading urban development with inclusive public spaces and placemaking. In 2019, he co-founded Placemaking X to network, amplify, and accelerate placemaking leadership and impact globally. He builds on more than 20 years of working on placemaking projects and campaigns with projects for public spaces. Ethan, if you want to say hello. 
Hi everyone, thanks Everybody so much for having me. Can, can, you, can you hear me, see me? I don't... Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Both. And um, not the, last but not least, Eamon O'Connor, our moderator, is a designer at GAL and believes cities are at their best when they bring people together. As an urban planner, designer, and strategist, his experience ranges from neighborhood racial integration to corridor, to corridor revitalization, from mobility planning to community-based climate adaptation. At GAL, he brings expertise in people-first planning and design, visual and written storytelling, and data analytics, analytics to project, projects that bridge scales and disciplines. His project work has ranged widely from exploring the impact of creative placemaking on mental health and social cohesion with the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to designing a next-gen mobility plan for a large-scale Florida development. Um, so that's what I got, uh, and we're all so excited to have you here. Um, and I'm going to switch things over to you, Eamon. Excellent. Thank you, Anju. Well, thank you to our audience coming in from around the world to listen to this very important conversation. And thank you to Cooper Robertson for, for convening us today around uh, this real challenge that many of our cities and communities, not just in New York, but around the globe are facing right now. And thank you to this wonderful panel for, for joining me and the Cooper Robertson folks and the audience more broadly to envision what our future might look like um, so that we can reshape our places in response to and in the recovery from this pandemic in a more equitable, healthy, and vital way for our cities. Um, at GEL, and I know everybody on this, on this panel right now and in the audience right now has been, we've been eyeing dramatic shifts in public life around the world um, brought on by physical distancing and this, this truly horrible pandemic. Um, whether it's the way we're getting around our cities or the way we are using our open spaces from our streets to our sidewalks, to our local parks, to our corner stores, um, at GEL, the urban design planning and strategy practice where I work, we've been eyeing these observations on the ground through observation and studies in New York City and in Denmark, close to home where we live, um, and in a global survey on public space usage. We're seeing varying responses by municipalities around the world um, to adapt our public spaces and our, our cities in the face of this pandemic, whether it's Bogota, an early mover, and I know we have some folks from Bogota on the line, you know, converting miles of its roadways um, to pedestrian and car only to accommodate new forms of mobility in this pandemic, whether it's Singapore uh, create, creating inventive uh, you know, public space designs that accommodate a, a six foot distance, um, whether it's Montreal um, being crafty with you know, sidewalk extensions on the fly to accommodate people waiting in line for, for grocery stores and essential goods. We've also seen how this pandemic has illuminated in plain sight the deep uh, and long legacy of spatial inequality and structural inequality in this country. Um, we're focused on New York today, but I'm sure this has relevance globally. Um, whether it's unequal access to parks and open space, um, chronic conditions resulting from severe air pollution um, that lead to higher fatality and infection rates, um, and a stripe, you know, many other um, tolls, whether economic or otherwise, that this, this pandemic has brought on um, in communities around the world, and especially in New York right now. But we're also here today not just to reflect on these challenges, but to craft an opportunity out of them and explore how we can reshape our places to prioritize our health, both in response to the COVID-19 pandemic at a safe physical distance in the coming months and perhaps years, um, but also exploring how we can reshape our places to be more healthy and resilient in broader ways, whether it's using this as an opportunity to adapt to new forms of mobility that are more active, like walking or biking, or that are more, uh, you know, or providing access to open space in places that maybe didn't have access to it um, previously, um, all while preserving the vitality that we so love about our cities. So during the conversation today, and I'll hand it over shortly to the panelists for some opening remarks, um, you know, we, we discussed beforehand and had some great sparring discussion, and I'm sure this conversation is going to take many twist, twists and turns, but we're really hoping to sort of follow a broad arc where we first and really define what we mean by social resilience and what that means in the light of the COVID-19 pandemic today and what, how social resilience varies for different communities and for different timelines in the next three, six, 18 months, two years. Second, we wanna get generative and explore some solutions both at the micro scale of our block or street or sidewalk, but also at the macro scale 
as we explore how our cities, regions, and countries can adapt from an infrastructure standpoint to accommodate uh, our recovery from this pandemic. And third, we want to get a little political and start exploring our own agency as shapers of our places um, in advocating for collective action at the local, state, regional, and federal levels with the, the policymakers and elected officials who in many ways govern uh, our response and the long-term implications of this recovery. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Senior Nielsen, who will give us a few remarks and sort of contextualize how this pandemic fits in the broader arc of New York City's history in response to crises. Thank you, Senior. Thank you, Raymond, and thank you all. I, I'm glad to be here. I just thought, <clears throat> while this pandemic seems to be more pervasive than any prior event that I've lived through, I just want to look back at two events that really have sparked significant discussion about social resilience and grassroots efforts. So starting with 9-11, next please. Um, it came with no warning, um, at least a sensible warning, um, and no understanding about what the future danger might be. It resulted in the complete destruction of a neighborhood, total lockdown. There was really no rational response as we uh, understood, especially people like myself who only live five blocks from um, uh, what was called Ground Zero, um, and many people fled the city. Next. Um, but interestingly, we were uh, talking about what were the impacts to a neighborhood. So this is out my window right behind me here. Um, and, you know, jobs were closed, people were um, uh, out of, out of uh, work, recovery was slow, but on the other hand, people bonded. And those people dressed in pink t-shirts there came to our neighborhood to sing to us, to make us feel better um, for those of us who stayed in the neighborhood. Next. Um, in terms of impacts to design, um, there was a, a, a lot of feeling about isolation, um, protection, obviously bollards propped up, cropped up everywhere, barriers to uh, access. Next. Um, and there were a lot of grassroots efforts to change urban design in Lower Manhattan and create better connectivity. And we did this all in the sort of under the eyes of the National Guard, and it was all incredibly bizarre. Next. And so, you know, we see these bollards cropping up. And one of the points I want to make here is the fact that <clears throat> we're after an event such as, as we're seeing on the screen, um, but even after uh, this pandemic, we tend to be very reactive instead of proactive. And I think that's one of the things we want to talk about tonight is how can we become proactive uh, in looking at creating better social resilience. Next. And obviously Ground Zero has come a long way from this image um, and uh, it doesn't necessarily really speak to me as having been ultimately a very socially resilient project. It was almost as if um, after the dust settled, literally, uh, we just almost went back to business as usual. And so as Eamon alluded to earlier, what we want to see is how we can embed this more deeply in the future. Next. And the next, oh, we can just skip this one. So then the next one I want to talk about, of course, is Hurricane Sandy. Um, this came with a little bit more warning, but certainly not with the anticipation of it being a 500 year storm event. Next. Um, interestingly, there was a, a tremendous amount of destru destruction. This is again, my neighborhood um, with the only building that had power, which was Goldman Sachs, uh, clearly a sign of <laughs> inequity. Um, and uh, it had a significant impact um, to low-lying areas and especially folks living in public housing. Next. Um, we see here on the Lower East Side, uh, a tremendous destruction to local services, communication, power outages, senior citizens stranded on upper floors, uh, and massive destruction to open space. Next. And, and um, you know, one of the things that in my practice we spend a lot of time talking about is resiliency and whether we actually should be living 
uh, where indeed we live, but that is another question for another day. So let's uh, go to the next. Should we in fact be protecting um, or rebuilding? I love this post-it um, situation that cropped up impromptu in the subway stations um, of people really trying to express their voices. And I think that's another thing we want to talk about here tonight. Okay, next. And so um, one of the things that um, our firm worked on was a project called New York Rising in Breezy Point and the Rockaways in Lower Manhattan about helping people figure out how they as a community um, could really respond to the next crisis. And so um, coming together, what were the tools that were needed um, aside from the billions of dollars needed um, to rebuild? Next maybe at the end here. So this is my neighborhood. Um, uh, today, people are banging the cans uh, out of the windows of stores uh, being closed. Um, and so coronavirus has again exposed many of the same issues that came to the forefront in the prior two events I showed. And so now is the time for us to really see if we can't embed this more deeply into our society and who we are as individuals and professionals. Thank you. Ray, we'll hand it over to you. Ray, I think you might be, you're muted at the moment. All right, can you hear me now? We sure can. Oh, wow, wonderful. Okay, well, thanks everyone. Uh, I'm actually uh, gonna be very, very brief so that we can allow time for all of us to engage in a community conversation with all the folks from around our communities from around the world. Well, um, very long title, but the idea is that um, resiliency is really driven by uh, local cultural uh, hubs of communities. Uh, and this has been the case um, throughout history. Um, I want to say throughout the modern history of the industrialized West. So let's go to the next slide. Yes. And so, um, as you can see, I, I'm focusing on community gardens. Let's start with um, looking at what happened um, historically during the Industrial Revolution. Um, massive amounts of, of folks were uh, displaced physically as a result of the Industrial Revolution uh, into manufacturing centers, which um, in turn became urban centers. Um, what happened there in the wake of that physical um, uh, displacement, there was um, the reduction of those individuals um, from being full human beings who were self-sufficient in terms of taking care of themselves, able to feed themselves, to individuals who were commodities of labor. And what that means is that they became, at, at certain points uh, during the um, manufacturing process during the, uh, within this capitalist economy, they became superfluous, i.e. unemployed. And as such, this um, created a, a huge crisis in many, many, um, centers around the globe where the Industrial Revolution was taking place, um, so much so that there was a tremendous amount of hunger, food insecurity. And so I like to cite the example of the response to this out of Denmark, actually. Uh, in the late 1800s, there was an initiative where um, displaced workers were organizing uh, around forming labor unions in order to consolidate their base of power uh, as it relates to uh, their uh, employers. In addition to which though, they realized that they needed to take more direct action in terms of supporting themselves in a way that was economically relevant, albeit it wasn't through financial remuneration. And in this case, they built gardens and those gardens were known as workers protection gardens. So this is a very 
very, very significant response to a massive uh, uh, historical event of human dislocation. Uh, with World War I, um, there was the shift of the, the economy uh, focusing on dedicating uh, productive economic resources for the war, uh, for war manufacturing of weapons and that sort of thing, uh, as well as logistics that uh, were uh, related to that, commensurate logistics uh, being, being uh, uh, manufactured. Uh, the gardens then, so uh, were developed so that people who were not able to uh, be employed in the war economy or were displaced by it could still grow food. They were known as Liberty Gardens. Moving forward, we had something during the Great, Dep the Great Depression is something that we're revisiting now um, economically. Massive, massive um, economic dislocation going on uh, as a result of the COVID uh, crisis. Um, during the depression, we had public works initiatives, which is something that I'll revisit um, very shortly. Um, and we had depression era relief gardens. Uh, ostensibly, so the folks could feed themselves to be sure as a result of having no income by which to do so otherwise. And also as the president at that time, President Roosevelt uh, uh, genuinely underscored that there was a genuine need to maintain a sense of stability by, by uh, via these community gardens where individuals could still maintain their sense of human dignity while being productive in a way relevant uh, response to the existential crisis of, of being economically dislocated. World War II, uh, similar to World War I, um, I think lessons were learned and the capacity of local communities to grow food was such that um, during World War II, uh, we grew in this country, 40% of the food that was consumed was produced by community gardens. Uh, uh, when you're talking about hundreds of millions of people, that's a very, very significant um, outcome of communities coming together uh, to grow food at, in a time of uh, economic dislocation. Um, Next, we have what I would uh, uh, regard as um, the history of municipal planning, uh, redlining, urban renewal, and plan shrinkage. Uh, uh, what this did um, uh, cumulatively had the impact of displacing communities economically uh, as a result of the disinvestment that took place under redlining, uh, the physically, um, under the dislocation that happened physically through urban renewal, that is to say the bulldozing of entire residential areas where poor working class folk, primarily folk of color, were displaced. And then um, a, a further a dynamic in that regard was the dynamic of plant shrinkage. And plant shrinkage was designed, uh, was municipally uh, it was a municipal policy intended to uh, cut back services during a, an, ac an economic crisis that the city and the nation was experiencing um, by cutting back services in the poorest communities in the city. And uh, doing so when there, were, uh, when there was really a great need for services because these communities were also bearing a disproportionate burden of economic unemployment and poverty. And so these examples really speak to uh, the question, uh, if community gardens were so relevant in terms of addressing um, massive social and economic dislocation uh, historically, how can we learn uh, in terms of the current COVID crisis um, that's, that's confronting all of us? And I dare say I want to highlight, in this case, um, community gardens uh, uh, of the proximate um, contemporary era and the workers' protection gardens. Why? Because those, those two historical initiatives have been a direct result of local communities organizing themselves and taking ownership over their destiny. So next slide, please. Yes. Um, so 
this is a picture of a community garden before it was a community garden. Our community garden in the South Bronx, uh, known as Brook Park, this is what Brook Park looked like in the 1940s. As you can see, the land um, was occupied by a, a residential structure, a building, uh, pretty solidly built as it looks to me. Uh, this happened during the 19th, this is a photo from the city archives of New York, and it, show, it was taken during the 1940s. During the 1940s, is when the policy of redlining, that is to say the financial disinvestment in local communities uh, was actually taking place where communities could not draw on banks, could not draw on other uh, fisc uh, financial resources by which to develop themselves. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, and so this is um, the land of Brook Park in the 1980s. And as you can see, this corresponds to the time when uh, urban renewal and planned, the, the very um, proximate wake of urban renewal and planned shrinkage. During urban renewal, communities were being bulldozed and or they were burning down. And this was happening very intentionally. And there was a, an intentional policy on the city by which to, to uh, depopulate, if you will, um, local communities because they were viewed, and these communities happened to be poor and working class communities, primarily minority communities of color. Uh, and these policies were to force people to move out, out of the city somewhere else because the city ostensibly uh, rationalized and justified this, this um, uh, type of destruction by saying, hey, we can't support these folks. So the next slide, please. And so here you see what happens uh, in the wake of, of uh, redlining, in the wake of urban renewal, in the wake of plant shrinkage, the community uh, came together, community residents came together to uh, uh, really clearing out uh, what you saw in the previous picture, uh, all of the garbage strewn uh, uh, lots around the city, in this case in Brook Park, and began to plant growing food, uh, as, as well as other, other trees and plants and, and flowers and that sort of thing creating places that were productive as well as beautiful. Next slide, please. So here, this is an example of that same policy and the response on the part of the community. As you can see on the, on, on the left, I'll explain, there is a map. That map shows where fires were going, uh, were, were happening in an uncontrolled manner and <clears throat> services for addressing a fire, that is to say, the uh, fire, fire department was cut, uh, health department services were cut, police was cut, all kinds of municipal services were cut to these communities and as they were burning, as they were being burned down. Um, on the right, um, that map, you see what these communities did in response to plant shrinkage and those green dots each represent a uh, community garden. So as you can see on the, the um, spatial distribution of community gardens actually lines up with the spatial distribution of urban renewal and, and planned shrinkage. That is to say, this is a reflection of what local communities have done in terms of taking responsibility and taking ownership over the issues of, of mass dis dislocation and reclaiming uh, land in a way that promoted their, their resiliency. So I'm going to leave it there. I'll just read this because it's very important. Um, the so-called, um, I'm reading from a quote here uh, from uh, the journal Jacobin, uh, the so-called planned shrinkage policy of the mid seventies, which cut off public services, transit, sanitation, police and fire uh, to poor and working class. And then of the commissioners of that time, uh, an individual who was the head of the housing and development administration, his name is Richard Starr, Roger Starr, I'm sorry. Roger Starr said, stop 
the Puerto Ricans and the rural blacks from living in the city reversed the role of the city. It can no longer be a place of opportunity to keep him a peasant. So in light of this uh, very, uh, what I would characterize very polemically as malice of forethought, an intentional policy aimed at um, political minorities of, of black and brown folk, um, notwithstanding the community was able to come together and come together in a way to promote their resiliency uh, via place-based initiatives such as community gardens. And that's it. Thank you. Excellent. Ethan, thank you, Ray. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Um, and I, I want to start by thanking Cooper Robertson uh, and Anju for hosting this. Uh, long thought of Cooper Robertson as one of the premier urban design firms out there, certainly. And of course, uh, Eamon, thank you for, for moderating uh, you know, uh, you know, Gail and, and Jan Gail has, have been you know, mentors of, of ours. And um, since I was young, actually, I've, I've known Jan and, and, uh, and learned, continue to learn a great deal from, from, from Gail architects globally and collaborate with them in many parts of the world. So um, you guys have brought so much to this conversation. And Signe, of course, locally, we, you know, you're so revered as leading great projects, but also the conversation in, in many generous ways. Um, in the in the in the recovery after after Sandy and uh, and nine eleven um, and and uh, and Ray, thank you. You know, I've heard about you for a long time through my wife, who's also in the urban agriculture world in New York. Um, and uh, this is it's such a great model and story to build on, and really the the roots of of um, the placemaking movement. Um, you know, owe so much to to the, the history that you that you tell. Um, and you know we've long found that the limiting factors of, of public spaces are sort of the management, the informal and informal governance models that need to emerge, and certainly how um, these crises have informed new, different, um, and inspired different eras of urban agriculture have been uh, have been have been central to learning for public space management of all of all kinds as well. And I want to there's a lot I want to come back to um, with that. Um, but just to sort of introduce what we're doing and uh, with Placemaking X is a new organization we've just launched in the last uh, six months, um, really to recognize the way that uh, community driven shaping of public spaces is emerging as a movement around the world and how learning needs to be networked uh, and supported and amplified. Um, and so this conversation is very helpful to, towards those goals. Uh, and certainly our, you know, our learning has been you know, grounded in New York and all of our hardest projects, you know, Project for Public Spaces, where I was for the last 25 years, um, were, you know, were in New York. Uh, uh, um, and certainly we were able to tell the stories of some of this learning too and inspire other parts of the world. So, um, but I also, with Placemaking X, what I'm finding is we're learning a lot globally and I want to, you know, connect uh, the ideas and models globally to bring them back to New York. I think um, the models of place governance and social resilience that we're seeing in some of the poorest parts of the world, even in informal communities, um, offer a lot to how New York can recover, uh, how we make sure to preserve what's working there, especially in some of the lower income neighborhoods in the city, um, and how we can you know, forge new models. Um, for, so go ahead to the, the next slide. You can sort of slide through as I go. Uh, of course, the placemaking movement has a lot of roots in the work of Jane Jacobs and William White. Um, my father worked with, with, with both of them. Um, and Jane Jacobs, you know, in her book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, you know, talks about dull, inert cities, it is true, do contain the seeds of their own destruction and little else. Lively, diverse, intense cities contain the seeds of their own regeneration with energy enough to carry over for problems and needs outside of themselves. Um, so this idea of, of of great places, of dynamic places, as resilient places, as socially resilient places, um, is, has been you know, core to, to, to the urbanist conversation. Um, there's a lot of ways we need to continue to build on this. Um, you know, a lot of the, the after Sandy and after uh, you know, a lot of the resilient conversation has been more around the form of cities, more around the infrastructure, uh, and very necessary, very important. But we think the way to drive demand for that and make sure it gets used and drive creativity for the design of, of good infrastructure is to also look at the, the social side, the community capacity side, the social capital. Um, and it's the integration of these two. It's not one or the other that's important. We see placemaking as the integration of 
communities and places and how you create a virtuous cycle of support between the two. Um, one of our conferences had a woman named Fran Tonkis from uh, uh, LSE um, in London say that uh, we don't need to just build for social life, we need to build from social life. Uh, so go ahead to the, the next slide, I'll come, and I'll come back to that idea as well. Um, but when, you know, many of the goals of building cities have been very segmented for a narrow set of goals that has been, uh, that you know, Jane Jacobs was critical of early on, um, and of course building for the car and traffic is, is sort of the easiest one to pick on, but I think is also the most relevant uh, right now is, is we have a real opportunity to reinvent how we use our street space to serve our communities. Uh, both our immediate public health goals, but also our, our, our recovery and our ultimate resilience in our cities. Um, so we think if you plan for cars and traffic, you simply get more, in traffic, more cars and traffic. It's a taking culture, a privatization of the street, of, of public space. Um, we, there's many forces doing that, but cars have been the most egregious. Go ahead. Um, so, but we think it's not about being against cars and traffic or against any of these solutions that have been driving the shaping of cities, um, but for people and places. And for uh, and this focus on place we see as, it's not just a nice to have, but it's an essential service. The, 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 the connection to our public spaces and the connection that we forge to each other through our shared spaces is what's driving the, um, the social capital that's, getting, that's serving us in many ways right now. Um, there was a study done uh, after after Fukushima of actually of a, an average of many different disasters that found that 95% of of aid after an average disaster is rendered through existing social capital networks. Um, so, but but to come back to this image though, that, you know this we we've seen how reclaiming street space, how people can connect to each other again quickly, how they want to to be part of their spaces, and how um, social life can and will resume. We want to make sure it's done very safely. Um, and but also in ways that build social capital and resilience going forward. Go ahead. Um, but also in, in places like, like Nairobi here, this is a street that had been clogged with traffic and they, we've had several placemaking weeks that our networks have been part of there uh, where they've temporarily demonstrated how the life of the street can reclaim it, how the businesses can support it. Um, and that's led to and informed a design of the street that's been more permanent. Go ahead. Um, you can, there's a few slides here. So we had a few different placemaking weeks over every every year discussing public space advocacy globally, bringing together the public space advocacy community in the city. Uh, and then um, and then it led to and informed a, a more permanent design of the street, all driven by the local community and local activists. Go ahead. So you know, more temporary designs uh, as an interim level and then a more permanent one, go ahead. So that's before it was clogged by traffic, defined by cars and traffic, and now it's defined by people and places. And so we have an opportunity to do this virally around the world, and there are great examples. Um, uh, if you look at the hashtag uh, that Mike Leiden has set up, uh, COVID streets, COVID-19 streets, uh, you'll see examples from all over the world. Go ahead. So, but this is a broader paradigm shift than just streets. Um, the city we've actually worked the most in over the last 20 years or so is in Detroit. Uh, and we've seen this sort of narrative emerge that it's not the most livable city, it doesn't have the best places, but this feeling that if you've lived here forever or if you're moving there, you feel like you can help shape it. You're not just consuming, it's not just a city to consume. The sort of consumptive city actually correlates with high cost of living and exclusionary culture. And there's lots of good tensions in Detroit still, obviously, about, about who, who gets to be there and you know, are people getting pushed out. Um, but those tensions are informing, a, I think, a more educated discussion and, and instead of implementation policies there um, and creating a buzz where if you do move there, you move there on the terms more of a local vision um, and invest in ways that contribute to local culture and identity. Uh, so this is a model of a lot of the informal governance. In, in the downtown, we, we worked on this central square in the downtown that cost $20 million to, to build and attracted billions of dollars investments in the blocks around it. But perhaps even more importantly, in some of the poorest neighborhoods, the same models are applying through a more resourceful, um, uh, sort of lighter, quicker, cheaper approach to, to regeneration. Okay. Um, in Mexico City, this is a space that uh, 
that we did some organizing around um, with an organization called Lugares Publicos and uh, that's also helping to lead placemaking X right now. Um, and this space became the, uh, the, the gathering point after the earthquakes there because of the social capital that was built through the process of creating this space. So um, go ahead. So we're, so we're seeing people converge from many different causes and crises uh, to this focus on place um, and, the, the, and the social connections to place. You know, and, and so you know, we can't forget that many crises in the world, are, especially around public health, are caused in large part by social disconnection, the lack of access to safe places from addiction to depression to chronic diseases to, to road deaths. Um, and similarly, many different uh, professions, disciplines, sectors, um, you know, have very good solutions we need to draw on more, but we're not drawing on their creativity enough, they're demanding their services enough, and we see the focus on place as a means to, to build capacity for more, a broader uh, systemic change um, towards sort of lighter, quicker, cheaper, short-term things that can happen right away, um, but also creating the, the collaboration models and governance models, financing models that can, can implement these efforts more resourcefully. Um, so each of these ca causes, whether it's design communities, the transportation world, public markets, local food, gardens, they're all seeing how a focus on place can, can help broad, broaden the resources, talents, um, creativity to their goals um, and create you know, a, a new, new models that, uh, that can enable a more, more fundamental shift that we need. Go ahead. So, th so the paradigm shift that we're seeing. A couple minutes left. I'm just going to give you a quick. Okay. Thank you, Eamon. Yeah, I'll I'll speed through the last couple here. The the paradigm we're seeing paradigm shift we're seeing is from what we see called project driven, where it's sort of efficiency. Let's build the facilities to discipline led. Let's get the best experts. Uh, to place sensitive. Let's be responsive to place. Let's um, let's uh, be responsive to. Uh, uh, to to a crisis, um, and we need to draw. We need, these are all important in these crises. But to, what we hope this particular crisis can engender um, is how do we come out of this through a place-led approach? How do we rebuild back our communities, drive drive with identity and resources and assets that are most important to our communities um, first and foremost? And uh, so, how can they, we make sure they drive the social connections, the place attachment? Um, and the resilience com coming out of this. Go ahead. So what is placemaking? This is a term we started using in the 90s um, to distinguish you know, what we saw as sort of a new idea of, of, of this place-led idea, the, the, the community is the expert. We're not just designing for communities, um, but we're the biggest impact we saw that we were having was actually just how we help people realize that they are experts and help draw out that expertise further. Uh, go ahead. In the, um, so, there was actually an MIT study several years ago that found that the, the, the biggest benefit of placemaking wasn't the improved place, but the improved social capital built through the process of it. And they saw this virtuous cycle between the place creating the community and the community creating the place. So, so placemaking is a collaborative process by which we can shape our public realm in order to maximize shared value. Um, and it's strengthening the connection between people and the places they share. Go ahead. So just sort of an evolution uh, of the placemaking movement, you know, Rudin, Jane Jacobs, and William White, my father worked with, with them, um, founded PPS in 1975, um, started calling it placemaking, go ahead, in the 90s. Um, but we saw this emerge globally, and then we started to realize that we needed to network the movement uh, and to, to, to respect and support the leadership and, and learning that's going on all over the world. Uh, and then we start to see in, in the last couple of years really how it started to self-organize around regional networks. There's now more than a dozen regional networks. Um, recently, there's an Arab world network uh, called the Amakan Network and Placemaking India Network. Uh, last weekend, we had our Placemaking Latino America Network organize uh, its fourth conference this, with over 3,000 people um, around the world. Um, the last one was in Lima. I saw someone from Lima with uh, 1,700 participants. Um, so we've launched Placemaking X to sort of amplify connect and um, support impact amongst amongst these leaders globally go ahead that's uh yeah i can i can stop there we oh, can okay, yeah so we so yeah we just the key, the key message you know is that we want is is this agency that that, that you, you all mentioned at the beginning is that everyone has the right to live in a great place but more importantly everyone has the right to contribute to making the place where they already live great and coming out of this we need to uh support uh engender and challenge everyone to help shape their communities um to thrive going forward Excellent. Well, I think that's a great, great note to transition into our into our discussion period. 
Um, you know, we're gonna, you know, during the course of this conversation today, we're here to talk about some very big grand challenges that are affecting communities in very severe ways. Um, but I also want to acknowledge that this crisis is affecting us all very personally. Um, so I thought it best that we start close to home from New York City um, with each of our panelists, our dense bustling city that we know and love, um, maybe not so bustling as we're used to right now, um, but to get a better sense of what social resilience actually looks like on the ground. Um, so Senia, let's start with you, um, given that you, know, you were recalling some of the experiences uh, from previous disasters in New York City. Um, since this crisis began, what's one personal experience of social resilience that you've seen in your community, whether it's on your block or in your neighborhood or more broadly in the city, a trend that you've observed? What, is, what, is that, what does that actually look and feel like on the ground? So we can wrap our arms around what social resilience actually means. It's interesting that this event, um, unlike the two that I spoke about, um, I, I feel as if social resilience started very, very slowly. At first, it was people running to the grocery store, hoarding toilet paper, and it was sort of every person for themselves. And it was, um, and I, it, it took, it seemed to me about two or three weeks before people actually started reaching out to somebody else, instead of just thinking about, it's all about me, it's all about me. And so, um, you know, unlike 9-11, where I'd run around kissing and hugging anyone I saw who had survived and who stayed in the neighborhood, Obviously, I can't kiss and hug them now. Um, and so uh, I guess my social resilience is my daughter lives across the street with my three grandchildren. And so we meet every night on the loading dock and we don't sit six feet apart because we are of the same family. Um, and we just talk about the day. And you know, sometimes neighbors walk by at a safe distance and we wave. And um, so we're beginning to feel as if our, our what's left of our community that hasn't fled, um, we're now sort of, um, we understand we're in this for maybe a longer haul than any other event that we've, we've survived. But I will say it started out very rockily, in my opinion. Great. Ray or Ethan, what does it look like for you and your communities on the ground? Yes, um, uh, it's a great question. Um, it, it allows me to just build off of uh, the history of community gardens. Uh, community gardens have uh... Oh, Ray, your audio might be uh, tapping out for a moment. Uh, here. Community local, uh, hyper local yeah. community resilience. Great. Oh, looks like you're muted. Ray, I, I think I unmuted your phone. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, great. It's a, it's a little bit of an echo. Yes, so I'm gonna, all right. So yes, um, community gardens are, are wonderful. Am I okay now? Yeah, you're great, Crystal. Okay, so community gardens have, uh, the wonderful thing about communities coming together in response to a crisis is that uh, as, as community uh, residents have done in the formation and the building of community gardens is that they built up an inherent capacity for resilience. And so we're taking that infrastructure of resilience now and, uh, to respond to the COVID crisis. Let's just talk about one area of the city, well, there's a couple, but I can, I'm, I'm gonna talk about the Bronx, the South Bronx. What we're doing is we, uh, as community, as networks of community gardeners, we have actually divided the Bronx into regions. So the North Bronx has a hub of six or seven community gardens. The, the West Bronx, another hub of six or seven community gardens, and so forth and so on. In the South, South Bronx, another hub of uh, maybe a dozen community gardens and so forth and so on. And what that means is that we are now coordinating um, uh, the wherewithal by which to aggregate, to grow food, aggregate that harvest and coordinate the distribution of that food that's, that's being grown out of community gardens. Uh, I, I just might add that, you know, food, fresh, fresh vegetables and fresh fruit are really, 
what's needed in terms of promoting the body's immune system. Uh, and, and so we're really, really happy to grow the ginger, to grow the collards and the kale and the spinach, to grow the garlic, and to distribute that out, knowing the kinds of impacts that it will have on um, people taking ownership over their health uh, in light of this COVID crisis, not waiting for a vaccine, but taking responsibility. And we are playing a role in that in terms of coordinating local efforts. I, at my community garden, I run an alternative to incarceration program, and I'm still in, in, uh, actually employing a couple of young people to help um, prepare the farm for food production. So I'm really, really happy about that, and we're we're reaching the folks that are uh, most uh, most impacted by the COVID crisis. As you will know, uh, well know, places like the Bronx and certain places like Brownsville and Brooklyn have been. Uh, uh, really severely disproportionately impacted by COVID. And we're happy that we're able to provide a response of resiliency uh, in that regard. Excellent. Thank you, Ray. Ethan. Yeah. Um, in my neighborhood, one of the first reactions was uh, an evening um, playing of music, sing, singing, uh, everyone standing out on their fire escapes and they're in, looking at the shared back uh, sort of courtyard. Um, is wonderful and, and and then walking through the public spaces i do i have felt you know people are more spaced out and it's more sparsely um used you're more aware of uh the the, the space and the people in it you connect to them you go you're you slow down a little bit i feel like everyone's slowed down a little bit i agree it's not the same as after sandy or 9 11 where people really connected wanted to be right around each other on everyone's stoops um but there but there's there's some of that people are increasingly people are stopping on street corners distancing um, you know, stopping my, my father lives not far away. People, he sits out on his stoop. People can talk to him as he goes by. Uh, my kids put out a little hand washing station uh, in, in front of the, that's hands free in front of his house. So people, kids can stop and others can stop and wash their hands um, as they go by. Um, but certainly, you know, I do want to, you know, point out that, you know, in the, in the neighborhoods that are hardest hit, there is uh, and someone pointed asked about density too. There, you know, it is the neighborhoods of lowest, uh, the poor neighborhoods, the neighborhoods of lower access to to healthcare and resources, uh, and with pre-existing conditions, often because of, um, of 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 you know of social challenges and social disconnection, um, that are suffering the most. It doesn't actually correlate that much if you look at a lot of the maps with density in the city. It, uh, I just saw a map today that actually shows that it correlates very highly with car ownership rates. So in neighborhoods that. Uh, that actually have more, probably more social isolation and low, lower social resilience. Um, uh, you know, it, it, I mean, we have to, you know, we don't know the causation and there are a lot more data has to be understood. Um, but if you look at those neighborhoods and then that, there's also higher rates of, uh, of, of COVID-19 uh, in some of the suburban areas just outside of New York per capita. Um, so there is a narrative that needs to be countered around the correlation with density uh, and placemaking that could have destructive focuses on, on how, how we, people aid is rendered, um, and also how, uh, how we recover and change the shaping of cities after this. That's a great transition. I think there's these two elephants in the room, certainly that came up in our conversation initially as a group, folks. Um, you know, there's the one narrative around, you know, how this pandemic is demonizing density. What is the sustainable, walkable future of our cities look like if people don't want to live in close proximity to one another? Um, clearly we want to tackle that and, head on today in our conversation. And there's the other elephant in the room, you know, that, that Ray and you, Ethan, were both speaking to, um, which is, you know, the fact that this is just laying bare a lot of long time legacies of disinvestment and inequity. And, you know, in some areas that might look like higher rates of air pollution that are tied to more chronic conditions and in other areas that might look like, you know, less ac access to walkable infrastructure. Um, but there's, there's these sort of two elephants in the room around density and equity that are really shaping the, the conversation around how our places respond to this pandemic. So how should, we, how should we define what social resilience needs to look like in light of those two issues? How should social resilience be able to, uh, to thrive in a dense environment? And how can social resilience overcome some of those deep inequities that, that we're seeing on the ground? Uh, I do think... <clears throat> that in all, in all of this, and you know, while I appreciate that this pandemic is, a, is you know, a disaster for people, countries, cities, I, I don't think we should throw the baby out with the bathwater. 
that um, climate change remains the biggest long-term global threat and that density has demonstrated its ability to be one of the best um, strategies we have for combating a lot of the core uh, causes of, of climate change. And so um, I do agree with Ethan that there's a, there's a lot of data that still needs to be um, understood about the degree to which uh, pure density uh, is actually causal. I mean, I think there's obviously certain uh, instances where we can recognize perhaps that a crowded subway is not the best place to be in a pandemic, but is a, is a dense urban area a problem. And so I see, you know, when I hear these issues, um, I, I tend to think, well, what can I do as a designer? What, what can I possibly do here? Um, you know, I can't make cookies for the fire department like I did in 9-11. What can I do? Um, and so one of the things I can do is think about how to design um, for the short term for, you know, what Ethan called lighter, cheaper, quicker, the tactical urbanism strategy, so to speak, that may be with us for the next, next 12 to 18 months. Um, and, uh, you know, this is by no means to um, say that what Ray is doing is, is probably the most effective thing that you could do. Um, but what I can do maybe is to think about ways that in the shorter term, uh, we can use the, the sidewalk space and exactly what Ethan said, really, that we just, uh, we, we use this opportunity um, to begin to change the balance uh, of occupation uh, of the public realm in a way that makes retail able to function, that makes us able to sit outside in a cafe again, that enables us to social distance when we walk down the street. So I think there are some short-term things that I would hope result in longer-term strategies, but um, you know, I, I am, am quite focused on what I can do to be useful at this time, because I feel so desperately in need of being useful right now and I'm not a nurse. Ray or Ethan? I'm glad to jump in there. Um, so, I mean, I, I think, you know, New York's, in some ways, the, the, the neighborhoods, the, the, the main streets around the city are the strongest part of the city. They're the, the and need to be seen as the future of the city. Uh, the, the models of how, how businesses, cultures almost self-organize to shape their streets, to build the identity, preserve the identity, attract investment in ways that, that uh, continue to preserve. I saw someone talking about placekeeping um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the questions. Uh, it, you know, obviously, we need, to, we need to preserve the, the, the places that people love, the attachment, the people that are, we need to keep people there. That's what really resilience is too. We need to get them to be able to stay in these communities. I do think sometimes the best place keeping though is place making, is proactively shaping um, and developing a vision for our public spaces in ways that, that engage people, build social resilience through the process of engaging uh, and, and build places back even you know, stronger and better. Um, and so the vision going forward, I think we do want to envision our streets and, and our, our public realm differently. We need more public space because people need to space out more. We need it more than ever. We need to people to want to stay in, this, in, in their cities uh, and stay invested to keep the economy and, uh, going. And I am most concerned though about the, about the small businesses and especially in, uh, in, these, in, these, in the, the neighborhoods that are, I think are really the, the, the strongest part of the city. Uh, and around the world, small businesses are, are, are hugely underappreciated as employers of drivers of economic growth and hiring. Uh, and I don't, you know, while the stock market has gone down I think you know if the stock market doesn't reflect uh, small businesses, and that's what you know that's what's probably been hit the hardest, and is, is and and is is me and sometimes maybe the hardest to come back if it's not sustained. So how we allow street space, not just right now, there's a lot of attention for for the health benefits and the recreation and the spacing um, uh, of it, uh, you know. But now how we have to start to look really quickly about how uh, sidewalks, streets, parking spaces, parking lots can serve small businesses that, that can, can sell in these spaces, that can, uh, it can, can be sustained in, in, in new ways. Uh, and in, in the long run too, we, we actually, this is what streets actually need to be more like. They need to be, they need to work and manage more like, we manage more like markets um, where we curate the streets where we, they need to, they need just like community gardens are, are work when they're governed well, when people are, are allowed to shape them and be part of them and, it, and they're flexible 
and they have a strong identity and a sense of ownership. So streets, we need to learn from the, the, the community garden model of management. So maybe, maybe Ray can speak to some of that, but there's a lot of potential for uh, building on the main street model and, uh, and bids uh, and local governance. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing, um, you know, I saw someone sort of joke about how you know, do what the president says unless the governor says something different, unless the mayor says something different, unless your local businesses, because they're actually the biggest experts on what is what what's needed to make to make your community work and, and make it safe. So how we you know how we build and respect the community expertise uh, to come up with these solutions that are safe for everybody. Uh, though that's where the real innovation um, and 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 knowledge uh, can can emerge. Well, I think that's a wonderful, wonderful segue. Thank you, Ethan, and, and thank you, Signe, as well for for your remarks. Um, community, your your um, you know, to revisit community gardens. One of the things in in response to the question that Eamon posed about density and equity, I would like to add another consideration um, about speaking to to equity, uh, really from the perspective of human dignity, human dignity. And what I mean by that is that one of the things, uh, one of the, uh, the key, for me, components of resiliency is, is the affirmation and the validation and the facilitation of people to express themselves in a way that honors their sense of human dignity. Co community gardens quintessentially provide a vehicle by which people can be productively engaged uh, in a way that is self-determining, in a way that is... Um, uh, reflective of their culture and affirms their sense of who they are, affirms the sense of their identity collectively as well as individually, affirms their sense of, of efficacy and agency collectively as well as individually, and all of this honors their sense of human dignity. Um, I might add that, you know, uh, with all of the different cultures that we have in New York City, community gardens reflect that. And so, one of the most beautiful things is that every culture has foods that it regards as uh, very, very unique and very important for them to consume and that are very, very healthy. Uh, certain types of herbs and so forth and so on. I'm not going to go into that, that tangent. What I wanted to add, though, from a, uh, a design perspective is just thinking about, uh, you know, being productive uh, and growing food is an economically relevant activity, but that's uh, but that point of being economically relevant um, in communities that have been disproportionately impacted by this crisis as a result of historic as social and economic marginalization, we really need to look at the fact that um, generating local economies, generating solidarity economies, cooperative economies, circular economies at the hyperlocal level is extremely ex important consideration um, and therefore we cannot uh, divorce this discussion from economic development and in that case you know when we're talking about the green streets how do we engage in green infrastructure development that includes food production as well as the the you know the production and the development and the construction of green streets of green walls of green buffers to be sure, we need these um, types of green initiatives in the communities that have been most impacted um, because that is what has uh, informed their extreme vulnerability uh, uh, to this COVID crisis, the pollution, as well as the, the lack of being productively engaged from a remunerative uh, perspective, that is to say, being able to be employed. And so yeah. how uh, I look at resiliency from those two perspectives. That's great, Ray, and I think that leaves us with, you know, at least a starting definition of what social resilience needs to look and feel like on the ground. It needs to be operate from a place that, you know, respects the human dignity of every person moving through a community. It needs to be adaptable enough to shift from a market to a sidewalk to a pop-up open space as you were speaking to, Ethan. Um, it needs to provide, a, you know, a socially resilient community is one that provides equitable access to resources, whether it's food or open space. Um, and that spurs a type of collaboration and solidarity that can keep communities on, you know, the track of enough momentum to weather whatever storms come next. And I'm sure there's plenty more ways you could define and expand upon this notion of social resilience. But I think this the seed of our conversation is 
pivoting a little bit more towards solutions now. And I think one tension we're grappling with as a group and as a field of urbanists more broadly is how do we respond and stop the, for lack of a better metaphor, stop the bleeding now and, you know, put a bandaid on some of these, you know, initial hangups that we're having in response to the pandemic while also not ignoring some of the broader structural long-term um, challenges that, our cities are gonna be facing down the line. So how would each of you think about, you know, intervening in the short term in ways that serve us well in the long term? Because, um, you know, in many cases, the types of responses we have to disasters end up sticking with us for a while. You know, the way we moved through our communities was completely upended, you know, after 9-11. Um, and you can go to a TSA screener when the re airports are open again uh, to experience just that. So, um, would like to hear from each of you about how you, you know, each of you who's worked really across the micro and macro scales, whether it's seeing you, you working on a individual open space, but also advising the mayor on the city's, you know, climate change strategy, or Ethan, you working with individual spaces, but also creating a global network, or Ray, you working at the scale of an individual community garden, but also tackling challenges of workforce development and incarceration head on. How do each of you think about making sure that any one solution isn't just a Band-Aid, but it's also surgery, um, that it balances that micro and the macro all in one. I can, I'm glad to jump in. Um, um, yeah, and we, so we see, you know, we see placemaking as, as doing, not just planning. Um, so it, do, it is about let's, what, what can we, what people want to do something, they want to be helpful right now. And we need lots of small ways that people can, we're, we're having a, a, a porch placemaking week coming up some Australians are organizing, but it'll be globally. So what can people do in front of their homes on their balconies and their driveways um, just to, to start to come out of their homes a little bit uh, and give back and, and, you know, show their love for the community. Um, but, you know, but placemaking is really about, uh, it's about building networks, social capital networks at every scale from the place up. And that's what Placemaking X is trying to do globally. Um, and frankly, what the, the virtual gathering um, is enabling. Uh, something we were sort of planning on moving towards anyway um, is feeling we people really want to feel connected globally right now. The world is smaller. We're very interconnected. This this um, this crisis is showing how interconnected we are and how we have to figure out the solution globally, but also how ultimately it's 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 uh, just like just like with placemaking, it is it it the contagiousness, the the negative impacts and the positive impacts are all going to be very local. Um, so what this has to look like coming forward is we there's you know each community has an emergency to get people to fall back in love with their place and each other and give to it and realize that the wealth of our communities is so much about our shared wealth our public spaces and it's that shared wealth that drives uh, that actually drives you know, uh, economic viability and small business viability um, so how literally these businesses start to take uh, be supported in this in street space in uh, in markets, uh, how we take this opportunity to really reinvent our communities in ways that uh, um, attract new investment, new people, in ways that add to it, that keep the, the existing culture and, and economy and, and, and don't displace. Um, but uh, yeah, this is this has to be a time of innovation. It, it, this, you know, as as many as many crises are, um, but especially in, in street space, people are loving how quiet their streets are right now. Uh, they're, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's, and the thought of it coming back is, is really horrific. We got used to it. We accepted that cars privatized so much space uh, and, and drove fear and violence into our communities. Road deaths are still one of the biggest causes. I think there's, in many contexts, they're still much higher than, than, than COVID deaths. We got used to that. They're, you know, the road deaths are a virus in and of themselves. And road deaths also correlate with social distancing and cause social distancing. Um, and social, uh, rather, social disconnection, I should say. Um, so, you know, how do we, how do we, uh, we, we need a whole totally new vision for our streets, but it really starts at the main street level and that's just as relevant in a rural community, in a informal community, if, uh, in, in the lower income parts of big cities, uh, if, if, if not more relevant. And I think those parts, those communities actually can do it better. They've been doing, they've been informally using street space, governing, collaborally, co collaborating, better than many of the formal uh, expensive parts of, of the world that are, are, are selling livability at a very consumptive passive way, but actually aren't providing lovability, um, participation, so, uh, so emergent self-governance um, in ways that low income neighborhoods uh, actually can do. Well, I just have to say that I'm, I'm not quite 
I mean, I believe and I agree with everything Ethan said, but we're looking at a situation of 25 to 30% unemployment. And for as much as you love your community, if you don't have a job, you may not be able to stay there. And I feel as if um, somebody used the term today, trickle up economics, where in fact, what's keeping our society alive right now are the lowest paid people in our society, mm -hmm. the people that we tend to <clears throat> dismiss yeah. uh, most of the time. And you know, at seven o'clock, and you'll probably hear it, if I don't mute myself at seven o'clock, you'll hear all the, you know, the tin cans and the pots and pans from the neighbors across the way. And um, so I, I really am trying to figure out that I, I believe strongly that we must not be reactive and we can't do what we did after 9-11 and we can't do what we did after Sandy, which is to think if we put up a bunch of walls, we will quote, protect ourselves against the future. That is ridiculous. Yeah. And similarly, we can't bollard ourselves out of this problem. And so I do think that this is an opportunity where grassroots um, energy can really make a difference and hopefully can trickle up. That is assuming that enough people are able to um, uh, regain employment um, and, and are able to contribute to their communities. And this is the part that I won't, I don't know that we'll know for a while, but um, I, I, I feel as if, and you know, in my, my theory of the world, um, I feel as if we have to attack all levels at the same time. We have to work at the grassroots level. We've got to work at the city government level. We've got to require that our elected officials um, deliver on what they say they're going to deliver. Um, and I think, you know, so what I can do in my role in the city is, you know, try to make sure that we don't just decimate the budgets um, and that there still remains equity in these budgets because that um, is really going to be essential for any kind of recovery. So I think we each need to do what we can do in the ways that we can do it. Um, and, uh, but it, I don't think it's only a grassroots scenario here. I, I just want to say thank you, Signe, so much um, for really underscoring uh, the points around uh, employment. Uh, this is an extremely uh, existential uh, issue uh, in the communities that have been, um, that is to say, unemployment specifically. You alluded to 25% unemployment. Uh, that rivals the Great Depression. We are in a Great Depression, uh, as euphemistically as it may be referred to or alluded to in in the media or by um, elected officials. So employment is a huge issue. What I was actually, uh, that that's kind of what I was alluding to in my, in my remarks that I made just, just previous, previously. And I am, uh, let, let me just say this first. Um, I don't know if any of you or folks in our audience have, have been aware, but the food system is, is, is cracking. Uh, it's cracking under the weight of this economic, uh, the COVID as well as the economic uh, collapse, um, meaning that production as well as distribution uh, is coming to a halt. What that speaks to is that we really need to look at if we're talking about resiliency, how do we hyper-localize uh, food uh, production and food distribution? This is what I was uh, actually speaking to in my open remarks, the, the development and the organizing of micro food hubs. Right now, food hubs are thought of on a regional scale, and um, that regional scale right now is cracking. Uh, we, we have farmers that are... Uh, uh, pouring out milk, farmers that are 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 tilling in vegetables and and uh, throwing out eggs and so forth and so on and so forth. Uh, a, a huge a huge waste uh, at a time like this. But how how can we um, uh, hyper localize? And we can because that's the idea of the micro food hubs uh, uh, concept that we're beginning to implement in the Bronx. Um, that. 
Uh, and how do we look at, you know, our resources of land? Right now, with COVID, um, folks have been talking about, okay, we need to use the parks in order to bury the dead. And I have suggested in a number of policy conversations, how do we also, with all due respect to those families that are going through that pain, how do we also use the parks to feed the living? And, and and really look at this um, very, very strategically in terms of the reality of what's going on vis-a-vis our food system. Um, uh, and I also alluded to green infrastructure. These are things where we're talking about the, the planting of bioswales, the, uh, the planting of green walls, particularly in communities like the South Bronx and similarly situated communities that really do need green buffers in order to attenuate the impacts of PM 2.5 pollution, which exacerbates chronic uh, health diseases like diabetes and stroke and heart disease and and so forth. And so there is an opportunity I see here um, to really mount an ambitious public works uh, initiative uh, that not the, you know, on the part of uh, leaders, municipal leaders uh, at the local, the state, and the federal level really embracing the concept of a martial uh, public works um, approach to growing food at a hyper-local level um, and to greening our infrastructure. This will create the jobs, this will create the employment, this will create income beginning to circulate, and as you said, Signe, uh, creating that trickle up, uh, uh, that trickle up uh, economy. So I think that this is what we need to do uh, right now, and we need to do this in a way that also um, honors the, the need for uh, living wages in the process. That way, a community can be not, will not be vulnerable to future, uh, to any other future crisis, climate or health wise or economic wise. Thank you, Ray. That's a perfect transition to sort of the last, the last act in our in our conversation before we head over to audience questions, which is really around um, what our role is as place shapers, as advocates. Um, how are we, you know, mobilizing for the type of Marshall Plan scale change that 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 you're calling for, Ray, um, at the local level with our city leaders, at the state level. Uh, I know we discussed that, you know, the possibility for more regional cooperation, you know, assuming the federal government here in the U.S. isn't as responsive or even, you know, given we have so many folks from across the globe on like what the what the possibility is for more global alliances and partnerships. So so that we can get on to audience questions in a moment, I'll, I'll time the, your responses to these ones and we'll kind of do it rapid fire. But um, what do each of you think it will take for us to be able to exercise our agency as designers, planners, community organizers, and, and, and make that change happen at, at those various levels? What, what tools do you think are in our toolbox that aren't in any elected officials or policymakers toolbox um, that we can leverage in pursuit, of, in pursuit of more change at the infrastructural level um, so that our, our cities can adapt more resiliently uh, in the short term and the long term? I'll just say that um, we we need, in addition to all of us who are highly motivated and energized, we need leadership. And um, to Ethan's the sort of uh, joke um, about, you know, we don't have it at the top, where do we have it? And how can we, and how can we get it fast? Um, and how can we encourage um, whomever uh, we are seeing as, as leaders? And I think, right now, if you want my opinion, I think regional leadership is probably the best we've got. Um, and I think, um, I think COVID, more than anything, even though I would have believed that people would have thought climate change didn't have political boundaries, um, I think people are recognizing now that you know, there are many issues that have no political boundaries. And we're beginning to think as a region. We're thinking about how to recover as a region, and we're thinking about how this has um, a, that this needs regional leadership. So I guess if I were to say that's what, what I believe, if we could get, even if it's a Marshall Plan, um, my father actually worked for the Marshall Plan, so I know it well. Um, if we, but we, as designers, we can't be um, completely effective without a project um, and without big projects. Uh, I can talk till I'm blue in the face about green infrastructure, but. Um, and we do a lot of green infrastructure projects, but we need 
a massive infusion of uh, cash, leadership, uh, and um, a Marshall Plan of sorts. And um, that I, I, re I really think we have hit rock bottom in this um, country. And I did not live through the depression. I'm old, but not that old. Uh, I would say this, this is revealing a lot of the weaknesses of our of our country. How we how we haven't treated our you know our most vulnerable well. How they've become vulnerable to disease and um, and and it's reflected in our most vulnerable places uh, are 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 not supporting resilient communities either. Um, but certainly, the way out of it we you know isn't uh, you know it is to create more leadership on all scales to give everyone the tools to to lead. Um, and I think in some ways globally, the lack of leadership uh, um, at national levels in many countries is, you know, is creating a, a vacuum and it's, it's sad, but it's, it's, it, we actually need new models to emerge from the place, the district, neighborhood scale up uh, to really have the kind of impact, the change that we all need to address other crises of, you know, that is, as Sigmund mentioned, you know, the climate crisis is, is waiting in the wings is an even bigger one perhaps. And, you know, a quality crisis, there's, there's lots of, um, other challenges that we're not we're not meeting th and, and and have no momentum really to meet um, through existing systems. Um, you know, one of the the outliers, obviously, in national leadership is New Zealand, and uh, you know, and, and I've actually gotten to work there a lot. Um, and they're they're one of the countries that nationally is now supporting instead of tactical urbanism and short term changes nationally um, through a grant program. But they also have uh, are moving towards an enabling culture of of supporting placemaking. Um, uh, not just delivering projects, but creating demand for, for better projects and a more collaborative model amongst different departments and communities and sectors um, in, in those communities. An effort in New York, actually, that just got announced last uh, week um, uh, is something called the Neighborhood Empowerment Project. Uh, we, we worked with Mark Gorton, uh, the Open Planning Project and Transportation Alternatives um, in 2000. Six through 2010 or so to create a streets renaissance campaign that led to the public plaza program, the open streets projects, the um, you know sort of a new birth and in, in a lot of momentum in in, uh, uh, in in street reclamation. But it was more in you know more in the, with where areas where there's business improvement districts, um, some lower income neighborhoods. Um, but this new campaign, but led by Mark uh, uh, Mark Gordon, is called the, the Neighborhood Empowerment Project and looking to support. Uh, more neighborhood streets uh, to have the governance, to have the tools um, and the, the resources to be able to, uh, to to have their streets meet their needs more effectively. Um, so it's, you know, again, these there's a, there's a new, big need for new tools, new engagement level models, uh, and so you know that you, you go to the neighborhood empowerment projects and you'll see um, you know they're, they're looking for models to to lead the, this effort. Uh, yeah. Great. Ray, I, I, yeah, go for it. Yeah, I just, I, I just wanted to add uh, that um, I think that you know that was excellent, Ethan, particularly where you uh, referred to giving um, people impacted the tools by which to lead. Um, I, I really think that this issue of leadership has to be discussed uh, from an equity lens or through an equity lens, from a social justice lens. That is to say that um, leadership such as we have it, that is to say um, the, 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 the city planning uh, regime, the decision-making regime um, has not worked for uh, disproportionate, uh, uh, has not worked disproportionately uh, uh, for the communities that are being impacted by COVID disproportionately now. So what we need in terms of leadership going forward, um, so that we don't return to business as usual. Many folks talk about, oh, uh, I can't wait for this to be over and, you know, get back to, you know, uh, normalcy uh, as they conceive of normalcy. Normalcy is what got us into the situation. Normalcy is what is being exposed as, uh, as, as what is, uh, has, um, issued from, from this COVID crisis in terms of the disproportionate impacts that it's having on, on communities of color, in particular poor and working class communities, uh, as uh, in more, more broadly, immigrant communities as well. All of those uh, disproportionate impacted communities need to be at the table of leadership. Uh, 
uh, in terms of informing how this goes forward. They are experts. Uh, they, they know what has been impacting. They know what they need. Um, goodness knows from an existential perspective as a society, we have to include, we have to be more inclusive now than ever before. Uh, and, and so that, that's, that's what I would, uh, uh, say. Excellent. And that's going to be a great transition to our first audience question. Anju, did you want to set, communicate? Just thank you guys so much. That was a really excellent discussion. Thank you, Eamon, for um, coming up with some really engaging uh, questions. I think kind of transitioning to the question phase and, and getting to some of those, those great questions that have come up, just a great note to end on, this more sort of action-oriented um, perspective, looking at potential tools um, and models for the future. So. Thank you so much. Before we go to questions, I know it's seven, so maybe people are signing off, but um, please, if you're able to stay on, because there are a lot of great questions we're going to get to. Excellent. So the first one is a really great um, transition from what you were just discussing, Ray, and one community, particularly vulnerable community that we have not talked about today is those experiencing homelessness who, who don't have housing. Um, Curious to hear what this group uh, thinks of the following question from Florentina Anastasia. Um, what is the relevance between social resilience and economic crisis, especially for the homeless? What should urban designers do for the homeless during the pan this pandemic? It's a big one, especially as we face a, a major housing crisis as well. Um, I'll, I'll, you know, thank you for bringing that up. That's really important, and, and it's, it, it's we should have brought that up earlier. In fact, um, this has been the topic of a couple of Project for Public Spaces webinars, um, and you know, you know, certainly the you know the homeless are are um, the displaced peoples are have been hit, hit the hardest in this in this process. And public space needs to be at all times a space where they feel welcome, um, and. Uh, in, in many ways, so how how they're engaged, supported, um, given given spaces, housed, you know, is is something that you know, needs particular attention. Um, there's there's some interesting solutions. Um, I've seen there's a group called Love Beyond Walls in Atlanta that's actually using these same. I mentioned what my kids have put out a couple of these um, these these uh, hand washing stations. They've been putting them all throughout Atlanta uh, to to allow homeless people to. To wash their hands, which is a simple thing. I think that might be one solution that, uh, um, you know, we need more sanitary options, especially in New York City. Opportunities to use bathrooms or or, or wash hands in public spaces is, is is one, you know, thing that I think hopefully will come out of this and benefit benefit many people. Um, but how homeless people can not just be seen as a problem, but can be part of the solution. We've often in placemaking projects, we've often engaged homeless people as users of spaces that know how know how they're used, know the challenges. They're members of the unhoused population. They are often can bridge issues um, and and actually be engaged to help program spaces. Uh, be be hired sometimes to to activate to build social capital and social resilience in a in a community. Um, you know, there's some a lot of programs on the west coast and in, in, in some san francisco in particular that are that are doing this are, are doing this really well um you know hiring homeless people to clean spaces but not just to make not just maintenance and management and um you know maintenance but also uh, uh putting out games and chairs and uh uh and being taking pride in how they're contributing to the spaces as well great and i think for the for the audience questions unless anybody has a, a build um I'll kind of just shout out one and if one person has a, has a reply. The next one we have um, is from Andy Tan, who's asking, how does arts and culture contribute to social resilience? How does COVID-19 affect designing for cultural spaces? Um, artists and uh, artists across the board are, are really hurting right now. Um, how do you all think about them spatially? I think that's a, uh, a great question. And it's something we're actually doing in a, uh, on a project right now, which is to, uh, because museums, you know, you can't go into them right now, um, but there's lots of artists with lots of creative uh, energy. Uh, and so using, um, you know, urban canvases of which there are many, roll down gates, um, uh, all sorts of, of walls, all sorts of places 
there are opportunities, light poles, you name it, trash cans, um, where public art can uh, become a place that, again, gives pride. The things we've been talking about uh, today that gives a sense of identity of place, that gives pride to people who live there, that um, uh, helps them express themselves, express the pain that they're going through, um, and, uh, and even the hope, perhaps, um, that they have for the future. So I think that um, uh, pu public spaces are uh, a, a wonderful opportunity to do that, and I greatly encourage it, and it's something we're really trying to foster in a number of our projects right now. Just a quick thought there is that, you know, just the way Ray was talking about food hubs, perhaps we also have, you know, arts culture hubs that are you know, more external that something we need to have, need anyway is to, to uh, look at sort of turn arts and culture inside out um, from institutions and, and, and democratize it. Um, and in a crisis, you know, th there have been, the crises have gendered, you know, engendered great cultural creativity um, and, uh, and, and, and new, new cultural movements too. So how do we look at, uh, at creating the, again, the governance, the, the community um, and economic support systems uh, in neighborhoods more holistically, not just inside institutions to, uh, to support artists, culture, um, but also new, new arts and culture. Excellent. Um, one question when it comes to sort of the, the tactical um, this question is coming from Rebecca Dakudian. Um, as designers, placemakers, community leaders, um, how can we can, how can we pitch the importance of different strategies, interventions, projects on the ground when this pandemic is often thought of as a short-term issue? How do we get buy-in? Um, she follows up that this is kind of the opposite issue uh, that we have with projects around you know that are more adaptive to climate change. So you know. Oftentimes you might hear from a project or a potential client, let's say, you know, climate change is too far off. Whereas right now it's like, we're too busy tackling short-term needs. So how, how do you all think about making sure that we can prioritize uh, projects on the ground, uh, given that it's often thought of as a short-term issue in the pandemic right now? So I didn't completely understand that question. How do we tackle a short-term Problem yeah, in a, how can we as designers pitch the importance of certain strategies and interventions when this pandemic is often thought of as a short-term issue? How do we get buy-in? Well, I think it, one of the ways to do it is to, is to talk about, <clears throat> talk about co-benefits. So for example, if we took the notion um, of expanded sidewalks that has an immediate benefit um, uh, for social distancing, but has a much longer term benefit in terms of, uh, or, the, or the next layer uh, with re revitalizing retail, uh, and then to the next layer of just making our, our um, urban realm a more livable place. So I think that the way I try to sell these projects is on a multi-benefit, minimum co-benefit, because it, you know we're facing a situation where there are going to be zero dollars for just about anything, and so you're going to have to persuade a client, whoever has any money, whomever they are, um, and say that look, we can solve at least three things at the same time, including bioswales and trees and biomass and better air quality. Those all have to be uh, stitched together to make a compelling long-term argument that has short-term benefit as well. Yes, I would. I would thank you, Signet, for that. That that was excellent. Uh, I would just add uh, that in order to get the kind of buy-in that the person who posed the question um, for long term, while we're working on the short term, is um, community organizing. Um, this is what happened historically with the workers' protection gardens in Denmark back at the turn of the last century. This is what happened with community gardens in the 70s, people came together. And what I'm getting at, um, in, in both cases, but just to look at the proximate uh, history of community gardens, uh, they were started without uh, leaders uh, at the um, elected level, you know, making any policy. It was people that came together uh, en masse in, in local communities, but also together en masse, uh, 
to uh, make these initiatives happen. So what we need and what what is happening are, uh, if I just may might mention, you know, there's a movement, the Poor People's Campaign, um, being spearheaded by uh, the Reverend Dr. William Barber. This is a community organizing approach. And so what is needed right now, um, we are the leaders that we're looking for, particularly the most impacted community. So just like we're organizing food hubs throughout the Bronx, um, we need local communities to begin to organize. And so I'm looking that we need massive uh, uh, movement, uh, mobilization of the grassroots in order to influence policy uh, the way that we need to have policy. Um, that, to be sure, that's what happened on the Lower East Side of, of Manhattan. Uh, in the wake of Sandy, the New York City Community Garden Coalition, uh, we were able to use that community organizing to leverage a $2 million green infrastructure uh, grant to improve the uh, capacity of, of the green infrastructure capacity of community gardens to mitigate stormwater runoff as well as other climate change induced uh, damage. So community organizing, I think, needs to be brought in. Um, uh, again, uh, we need to have an equity lens, a social justice lens of including and in, 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 uh, uh, those that have been most impacted by, by the issue. So I think that that's going to be the key to buy, to, uh, to buy in. Organize at the local level. Uh, and as the saying goes, when the people lead, the leaders will follow. That's great. Yeah, a lot to learn from community organizers um, as we as we confront this. Next question is from Eugene Tan. Um, if we imagine what, that the work from home exercise that is being undertaken right now is so successful that it reduces the need for physical office space in the post-pandemic world, how do the panelists think this might affect our city centers? And how do they think urban designers and architects can be best positioned to realize a more diverse and accessible city? So, so my family's coming in here. Um, so uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, let me think. Um, sorry, can you, can you say it again? Yeah, so the question is around whether working from home will become the new normal and that will either reshape our city centers or allow us to re-envision them to realize a more diverse and accessible city. Yeah, so this is an example of working from home. My family just came in, <laughs> but, um, but uh, yeah, no, I think it's gonna totally change how we, uh, um, how, how people, people will choose place more than ever. They'll choose places they, they, they can live and work where they like more than ever. Um, and they, if they do have office spaces, they don't need as much of them. Um, they don't use much space. Uh, the, the, the spaces that are more connected to place that are, are in nicer are, are in places that people love more. Um, those offices will, will continue to be better. Um, I, I do, you know, hope, think it, it will detract from some of the sort of more suburban type office parks um, and, and suburban type office buildings we have in Manhattan and, and, and such too. Um, they're so expensive. Um, the, the more place-led models of development of, of, of office working where there is more social connection, more value to the bumping into each other, the, the serendipity that happens in an urban environment, um, that still is, 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 will continue to be all the more valuable. Um, um, and I think we'll benefit from the, 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 you know, the, the realization that we can all connect globally like this now. It's not that hard. Uh, and we'll, um, we'll, we need to all be building places locally and thinking, thinking and learning globally. Uh, so it's it's a it's a it's a new era for that certainly, um, and uh, you know in the real estate market is you know it does need to take a hit. It's been it's been driving a lot of wealth, um, a lot of investment in ways that aren't so healthy for everybody, and certainly are preventing access to to the economy and to, to places uh, in very you know ex very exclusionary and destructive ways. So um, that does hopefully it will just be disrupted a bit. One thing that I'm seeing that is not. Um, uh, and I've been on several panels now about this particular topic, um, which is uh, how are communities remaining um, connected, involved, and participatory? So you said I'm you know, president of the Public Design Commission, which I am, um, but it's very hard to have a public hearing um, over Zoom. And, um, and that's just a public hearing. I'm really speaking about how uh, we go and connect with people about their community. And I've had several projects right now that have put the community stakeholder engagement piece of the contract on hold because they feel as if this venue that we are 
you're uh, communicating with is not appropriate um, and it's not inclusive. It's not sufficiently inclusive. So while I think that there, there are many things that um, we can do uh, digitally or, or over Zoom, I think there's still some things that we can't. And I, I don't, I, I believe that, uh, you know, community stakeholder engagement remains a huge challenge if we did it from a distance. All right, well, this is the, the final question um, for today. And I think it comes from an audience member, Sebdim Hoskara from Cyprus, um, who asks, how or in what ways do places or public open spaces contribute to social resilience? This is essentially the essence of our conversation today. Um, so I'd ask you to maybe mention something that hasn't been brought up that you wish you know, had been brought up, or is that kind of kind of come up in your mind since uh, the start of this conversation. So again, how or in what ways do places or public open spaces contribute to social resilience? Ways that we haven't heard today. Oh, um, so this, this occurred when we were um, doing the several outreach um, post Sandy resiliency um, conversations with different communities. First, the first thing to do was to ask them, where did you go? Um, and some people went to a public school, some people went to a community center, um, and to find out what was their go-to place and where did they feel that they belonged. And, you know, back to Ray's point of leadership should be, you know, from, from the grassroots. Well, this was the, this was a, a real eye opener. Oh, sorry, my cat. Um, it was a real eye opener to hear people talk about um, the places that were so meaningful to them. And then I, as a designer, could help do something about it. So for this public school in the, in the South Bronx, we, we were able to give them solar panels so that they wouldn't be subject to power outages. So I think, um, I feel as if it is something that has to go hand in hand. I don't necessarily know that being outside um, is the only answer. I think it is a public building. Um, a public function, um, and there may also be public space associated with it. Um, so anyway, I noticed this in the South Bronx. I noticed it in, in my neighborhood. People gathered at the local public school uh, in, the, in the playground. It was where I think it was a sense of, of, of community. Uh, I, I would okay. say that the, the answer, uh, you know, to that um, question was in that question where, you know, how, how do public spaces promote social resiliency? Well, they do because people are affirming, are affirming one another. Uh, they're maintaining probably one of the most important things to them um, psychologically, and that is their sense of community, their sense of, of being able to relate as a human being with others, to talk, to share songs, to share news, to share experiences in the language that, uh, that they also share. Uh, what I would just add, um, uh, and I'm gonna be uh, uh, admittedly uh, polemical here, um, and that is that there ought to be, a, you know, from a, uh, from a density perspective, there needs to be a moratorium on real estate development of public land. In other words, um, what that um, individual asked, I would say we just need more public, more public spaces. That's what we need right now in order, as it were, to maybe um, distribute the population density in a way where we can uh, observe the social distancing, yet at the same time, um, uh, you know, uh, be, be, be healthy. Uh, and affirming of of community. I think that the sense of community is super important. The question that the artist asked was is super important. Um, how to have you know these types of affirmation of uh, these types of affirmations of who we are. So I would say moratorium on uh, real estate development to speak to. I, I think that was Ethan's point earlier, and and really uh, uh, increase public spaces for the very purposes. Uh, that were identified by that by that caller. Excellent. Thank you. So, um, 
so actually looking at the earlier part of this question too, um, you know, looking at European cities differences and in, in informal settlements, um, I do think that, you know, public spaces are what are driving the wealth and attachment in these. And when there's a lack of public spaces, it does make these communities much more vulnerable. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's through our existing social networks and uh, that are often created through our, our public spaces and how we connect with people in them. Um, and then the place attachment that we have that, that really creates these virtuous cycles of, 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 of social capital and, resili and social resilience. Um, so, uh, but in, you know, in, in actually our placemaking Europe network is our strongest network. And it's in part because sometimes we, we, the way we, public spaces have been copied around the world is often just looking at the design, but not the social, not the organizing and governance models that go with them. So um, a lot of the, the spaces are no, aren't as appreciated any, anymore and how they're, they're continually renewed and recreated and governed. Um, and then the new spaces are making big mistakes with design, just relying sometimes on design alone. Um, so you know, to Ray's point, we need to, we need to connect organizing, we need to lead with organizing coming out of this uh, and then make sure we drive the new development, drive demand for good development, you know, make sure we, we know what we want um, return to our public spaces, we appreciate them, advocate for them, um, but the, the, sometimes the best way to, to save them, to prevent them from changing, to keep, to do place keeping, is to have a strong vision for what they could be in the future, a new vision, one that attracts people and investment, new energy. Um, so this is a time of innovation, of, of great creativity. Some of us do have some more time, we're lucky to have a little bit of time. Um, we need to do that organizing that Ray talks about um, at all scales, locally and globally. Um, there's a hashtag places after COVID. We're looking to have a global conference um, really on this topic and one we and social resilience, I have to say, is a topic that's missing in the urban design, in the urban planning world in many, in many regards. There needs to be a lot more research done on it. Um, so this is so valuable that this has happened, but we're uh, we'd like to as placemaking X help build on this. This is we'd like to help share the, the results of this and the, maybe the good questions. We want to learn good projects, good examples, good research that's happening. Uh, and we'd love to help continue the other other events, um, and then have a have, and maybe make it a big part of this conference that, that's being led actually by the European Placemaking Network um, uh, to to develop uh, you know collective messages on this with the best case studies as well. So I hope we can continue this conversation and and uh, and engage more also with a lot of the the the, the, the people that the participants that have asked great questions. So thanks to everybody for really really Excellent. an honor to get to be part of this. Thank you. Yeah, and I hope that. Um, you know, today in our conversation, we've started to see what that what that vision might look like um, among ourselves as a group, and also with the, the audience members from around the world. So, thank you um, to each of you for your contributions and helping us understand what do we mean by social resilience and helping us generate some solutions that aren't just sort of small scale, but have big, bold ambitions um, for reshaping some of the long, long time inequalities um, in our in our public spaces and in our cities. Um, and for sort of building some urgency uh, among the folks on the call um, for change at the local, state, regional, federal, and global levels. Um, thank you for, for your active participation and thank you to the audience for the, the questions, honing in on some topics that we didn't get to address in our, the first part of our conversation. And thank you to Cooper Robertson for, for hosting us. I'll hand it back to you, Andrew. Thank you. Yeah, just thanks all around. Thank you also, Eamon, for moderating. That was great. Um, and to all of our panelists, everybody who came out and participated and stayed on the call to listen to some of the q and it's awesome. Um, I just wanted to do uh, one announcement that attendees, anybody who signed up will be getting a link tomorrow of this full recording. We'll also have the full recording up on the Cooper Robertson website, hopefully by tomorrow. So if you, I mean, you're not gonna hear this now, but Ask, tell your friends if they um, if you dropped off early, you can listen to it uh, later on. You can send this to your friends if you think they'd be interested. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, everyone. This has been great. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. Thank you. It's been a great privilege. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. Well, okay. all right. Be well and healthy out there. Yes. Thank you. And cheers to all of our sisters and brothers around the world that tuned in. Mm. Yes, indeed. Cheers. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you again.